Revelation 3 will begin in verse 14 to the angel, that is the pastor teacher, of the church of the Laodiceans, right? <clears throat> Notice how Jesus introduces himself. Now, remember, in Revelation 1, tremendous vision of Jesus Christ, John saw. To all seven churches, Jesus took a little bullet point or phrase out of that description and introduces himself to each of the seven churches. These things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I, I love that phrase. Here's why. Laodicea was famous for not having any form of water system you could use to drink. They had to import it all. Everything there that they would drink was what the Scripture calls lukewarm and uh, wasn't, uh, it wasn't drinkable. And Jesus says, listen, I'm the beginning of the creation of God. Water ain't supposed to taste like that. You got to understand, I didn't create things that way. The water in your, your uh, systems here, there's nothing can filter out what's in there. It ain't supposed to stay. It ain't supposed to taste like that. I know your works. You're neither cold nor are you hot. And we'll talk about the two emphasis of that. I could wish you were cold or hot. Uh, or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth because you say. Um, isn't it amazing how many times in the 24 years have I been here that you've heard me say this? Most of us think we're better than what we are. Everybody all right? Most of us really think we're better than what we are. Listen to what Jesus says, because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy, and I have need of nothing. And do you not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? I counsel you to, in, uh, to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich and uh, white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see as many as I love. Can we stop right there for just a moment? If you highlight it, you need to highlight that little phrase, as many as I love. Can I, just let me speak a word in your life right now. God's not mad at you. He loves you. And as many as I love, Jesus says, I rebuke and I chasten. We'll talk about those two words. Therefore, be zealous. The word means to be passionate, to be boiling hot and repent. You know, Tony, I can remember North Fairfield Baptist Church. In 1986, I'm sitting in a seat on a Sunday night, and I watched a little seven-year-old boy go into the baptismal, baptismal tank, and I was arrested. Are you listening to me? I was arrested by the power of the Holy Spirit. Pastor Bob was in the baptistry and baptized this little seven-year-old boy. And listen, nobody had to invite me to the altar. I, as fast as I could get there, I went to the altar. Why? Because I needed to be right with God, and I knew it. And nobody had to give me an invitation to come. That's what it means to be zealous, to be passionate. Nobody has to invite you to come back to Jesus. And by the way, when you repent, you don't care who knows. You're right with God. That's all that matters. Boy, I wish I could preach there for a while. I think I just did a little bit. Uh, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in to him and I'll dine with him and he with me. You imagine Jesus wants to have lunch with you this afternoon. Do you get what he's saying here? I love you. I'd like to have lunch with you this afternoon. Matter of fact, on Thanksgiving, I'd like, to have, I'd like to be an invited guest in your home again. That's what I'd like to be. If you'll open the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. I, it's hard for me to even describe. Put that in words. As I also overcame and am set down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit 
is saying to the churches. Now, Father, this is your word. It is alive and it is powerful, and it is sharper than any two-edged sword. I pray today, a great physician, use that scalpel today to uh, penetrate our heart again, our soul, our spirit. And if there's anyone that doesn't know you, I pray they'll realize today the, the precious moment that they have right now to say yes to Jesus. And for we who know you, I, I, I pray we hear the invitation of Christ begging us to come back home, begging us to be zealous again for him. Use this in Jesus' name. Amen. We have introduced several churches on our journey uh, together. And uh, so let's kind of do a little bit of review. We looked at Ephesus. Ephesus, we would call the careless church. Uh, they, they just, they, there was no zealous there. There was no passionate burning there to serve one another again. We did it out of vain repetition and, and just it's what we do. And, and it's not what we do. Uh, what we do when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we are the hands, the feet, the extension of Jesus Christ. Smyrna, the crowned church, the church that is suffering. And uh, I think uh, even this morning, um, while it doesn't fit the martyr complex here and the condition of the church, I got an email. I emailed Dr. Pat Melanson yesterday. He is and his wife are in uh, Thailand, have been there for years, and he shot me back an email and said, Pastor, please pray for my wife, Veronica. Her mom went home to be with Jesus. And uh, you know, imagine your mother is in her last days of life, and you're in Thailand, and you can't get there to hold her hand before she goes out into eternity. Uh, there's, that's the suffering that comes with um, being a, a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to ask you to pray for them as they come back and they have the funeral coming up here, I think the end of this week or the first of next week. Pergamos, the compromising church. Thyatira, the corrupt church. Sardis, the dead church. And then last but not least, we studied Philadelphia. And we termed Philadelphia the faithful church. This morning, we're going to examine Laodicea, and we'll call Laodicea the foolish church. They simply uh, were a foolish church. They thought they could do this thing called Christianity with an independent spirit. And understand, Christianity is a system of codependency upon Jesus Christ and upon the power of the Holy Spirit to breathe life into us and fill us with his spirit every day that we live. All of these seven churches were in a, cl a cl close proximity to one another. Uh, Ephesus would, would become the, the main hub for preaching for years to come where John would base his missionary headquarters out of after he is uh, released from the Isle of Patmos. Um, uh, Laodicea, about 40 miles due east of Ephesus, but some very rough terrain. It was destroyed in 66 AD, uh, would be rebuilt by Marcus Aurelius because of the Roman highway system. Now, we keep talking about strategic church planting and where we're trying to plant churches. And if you study through the New Testament and Paul's pattern, and he, he uh, founded some 55 different churches in the allotted ministry time given to him, he went strategically where if he could get a church there, they could send the gospel to the end of the earth. Isn't it amazing now that God could even take a church in the cornfield because of technology, because of travel, because of all the other things, he could take a church in a cornfield and allow them to impact the kingdom of God. Right now, we have a ministry going on every continent other than on Antarctica. Now, here's my prayer that God sends you, not me. Everybody all right? Uh, I, I'm not really concerned. I, I pray the people in Antarctica go to heaven, but I pray they do it and they don't have to hear it through me. But understand, God has so blessed that churches can be used that way. Uh, the Persians in this area set up what we would call the first po uh, post office and uh, first Pony Express system was developed here. 
understanding, I think we've shared this many times, but when uh, the churches are given to us, Ephesus, Smyrna, and right on down the right, what, why did we go in that order? Because that was the postal route of the day. So they would deliver first to Ephesus, then to Smyrna, and they'd work their way all the way around to the city called Laodicea. Tremendous banking center. Uh, the gambling industry had uh, taken over in Laodicea, the tremendous uh, racetracks uh, pe- where people would go to just spend a, a few days and kind of almost like the, the motto of Las Vegas, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Well, what happened in Laodicea would stay in Laodicea. Uh, they also had a, a, a marvelous theater there. And uh, Jesus would draw a couple of analogies from it. From it, they were also had a great medical center. Uh, they were famous for developing uh, an eye salve that was a very significant in, in helping to treat sight problems of the day due to the volcanic ash in the region that uh, people would lose their sight at a, a rapid pace, and this was helping. Um, they also, is another just kind of interesting thing, there was a uh, the first known per se system of air conditioning was founded in Laodicea at one of their castles there, and they ran a tremendous system of water that would go underneath the ground and the walls, and it would help cool the walls of the dwelling place there. It's interesting, though. The water there was used. Uh, it was not drinkable, and it was used in their medical center Almost like today, if, you, if something happens, God forbid, and a, a child uh, you know, gets uh, poisoned, uh, you, you run and you, you look for a little thing called uh, Ipecac, and you give that to your child, and it helps produce vomiting. To, to get that. That's what they use the lukewarm water for in their hospitals. And so Jesus would pick up on that analogy and say, now listen, church, uh, because you are lukewarm, uh, I am about to vomit you out of my mouth. Everybody understood. Jesus didn't even have to say, there's no commentary needed to the people of Laodicea. They knew exactly what Jesus was talking about. Dr. Warren Wearsby, in his great commentary on, uh, called the B-Series, said this, Christ introduced himself as the amen, the true and faithful witness, for he was about to tell this church the truth about its spiritual condition. Unfortunately, they would not believe his diagnosis. So here's how Jesus introduces himself. He introduces himself as the amen, an Old Testament title uh, taken from Isaiah 65, 6. When, when we're preaching, and I'll never forget in the old building especially uh, down there, we had a lot of folks that walked from the apartments that were behind us, and back in uh, there were numerous just duplexes and all, and people would walk, and we had a gentleman that that came once and uh, totally unchurched, never been in church in his life for any reason. And he started coming, and uh, uh, through the grace of God, I, w- I visited with him and his wife in his home, and they both gave their life to Jesus, got gloriously saved. And so I went back a couple months later to visit with them again, to talk with them about their next steps of baptism. And I, I said, uh, Bob, you got any questions? And he said, man, I do, Pastor. I, I got to ask you something. Why do people talk back when you're preaching? And I stopped for a minute, and I thought, talk back. He said, yeah. I said, oh, I got it. I said, I'll say something, and somebody will say, amen. Yeah, why do they do that? That's rude. Uh, There was one guy that I sat behind or in front of, and he yelled out, glory. And I thought, well, I know who that was. And I said, well, listen, here's why they say amen. Amen just says this, "I, I believe it's true. I, b- I believe that this all it is. Jesus introduces himself as the one that is true. You can say amen when Jesus walks in the room because truth just walked in with him. He is the, uh, or possesses in his essence a thing we call veracity, absolute truth. So these the amen. He is the faithful, which means he is dependent. He's the one you can count on, and he is the true witness. John goes into the courtroom of law. Remember, he'd been there about a year earlier when uh, the un 
faithful witnesses got up and testified against him, and that's how he's now at Patmos because he understood what it was like to go and watch people perjure. Isn't that called perjuring yourself? In the court of law, Tim, I get that right? When you, you don't give an accurate testimony or you lie about it? John understood. He said, listen, guys, I'm going to tell you something. When the amen, the dependable one walks in the room, this is absolute truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth because he is God. He is the faithful, and then he says he is the, the beginning, the arche, the original source of the act of creation. And then their, their situation, listen, um, things weren't made to have earthquakes and cities destroyed. That's not why I created them. Water's not supposed to taste like this. It's supposed to taste pure, something that can refresh you. He is the beginning, the original source of the act of creation. Now, again, understand the, the system of gods in there. So the, they had no problem with Jesus being a God. Matter of fact, if you want to make a little symbol of him, stick him up on the rack with the rest of him, promote him in the town square, you can do that. And Jesus walks into Laodicea and says, don't you ever dare put me on a pedestal next to another God because there is no God like me. Every other God is a little G God. Every other Lord is a little L Lord. I am the God, and you will not put anyone next to me. They cannot hear. They cannot speak. They are dumb, deaf, and mute. They cannot answer prayer. I am the only one that can change a life. I am the amen. And when I walk into the room, things absolutely change. And then there is, in your notes, the approval. The approval, and I would note for you, there is none. Listen, there was no need for Jesus to give them any approval. They were busy approving themselves. And as long as you think you're better than what you are, you're not going to listen to the evaluation of Jesus Christ. And Jesus walks in and says, uh, I got nothing to good to say about you. Not right now. There's hope. This is Hope Sunday. This is when we'll bless our community, but it's more than just blessing our community. This is a Sunday about hope. And Jesus walks into anyone's life and says, listen, as long as you're still breathing, there's hope. As long as you can continue to hear, there is hope. And there's hope for you. The accusation from Jesus Christ is the second. And in the Christian life, there are three spiritual temperatures. Well, number one, there's a burning a burning or a boiling heart, one that is on fire with God. You see, when Jesus said, uh, since you are neither cold nor hot in this region, just within a stone's throw of each other, there were three cities. One was called Colossae, the other one was called Hierapolis, and the third, Laodicea. Um, Hierapolis was known for its, its, uh, its natural uh, what we would call today hot tubs. And the temperature there would, would be almost to a boil in those things. And people would come around to this medical clinic from miles around and they would go and they would sit in this soothing, warm water. And Jesus says, listen, um, you're not even close to Hierapolis. You're not burning heart on fire with God. You remember after the resurrection of Jesus in Luke 24? A couple of boys are walking down the road to Emmaus, and Jesus just kind of slips up behind them and asks them, says, hey, fellas, what, what you talking about? And they looked at Jesus and said, where have you been the last three years? Where, I mean, you don't even know the events that just took place. This is being talked about all over the empire. And as Jesus explained what was taking place, and he started with Moses and worked his way through, could you, would you love to have been a part of that road? And Jesus said, after he walked away, listen to what the boy said. And they said to one another, did our hearts not burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scripture to us? Jesus said, uh, I'm looking for a zealous, a, a burning, a boiling type faith. And then secondly, there's a cold heart. Colossae, that pure, cold Water. Man, if they would have been able to bottle it in that day, they'd have probably said, like we said years ago, ain't nobody going to pay for water in a bottle. That's crazy. Uh, and now that we can't live without it, I mean, we just got to have it with us. Understand, 
a cold heart. I said, please get Jesus' analogy. If I do any good teaching right now, all antennas up. Jesus says, I, I want you passionate or it's better off you're cold. See, if you're cold, nobody has to go around you to get to the cross. So he says, please, I wish you were either hot like the hot springs of Hierapolis or you were cold like the pure cold water of Colossae. Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 12, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. So Jesus understood the analogy he was presenting, but then thirdly, he went right to the heart of the Laodiceans, and he said there is a lukewarm heart. They were once hot, but because of the volcanic ass, uh, uh, things that had happened in the region and the way things began to flow from the mountains, now the water was uh, impure. You couldn't drink of it. It would make you sick to your stomach you would almost like seawater would have hallucinations and all the things that would be accompanied not drinking pure water and John's emphasis if we get a little technical is in what's called the imperfect tense in the Greek language it means what what does it mean pastor it means this it signifies their intentional lack of commitment to knowing Christ again they had become such a professional at rejecting the advances of the Holy Spirit in their life. They had become a professional at saying no. They were intentional about rejecting the invitation to get right with God. Paul, when he wrote Corinth, said, uh, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babies in Christ. I fed you with milk, not with solid food, for until now, and listen, until now, you were not able to receive it, and even now, you still have no capacity to receive it, for you are still carnal. For there are among you strife and envy and divisions. Listen to what he says. Are you not carnal? Please get the next line. And behaving like mere men. Paul went to Corinth and said, you're when you're going down the street, when you're in your community, you, you resemble the same thing that an unbeliever resembles. How far can we go in this spiritual rejecting of Christ and his invitation to come to us? How far can we go? Jesus says you can go to that point to where you no longer respond, you no longer hear, you're no longer moved, and you look just like an unbeliever. So in your notes, I want to compare the church's analogy with what Christ really saw. And under the church, this is what religion will produce. And with Jesus, this is what the reality is of that religion. So in your notes, let's start on the left side. The church said, I am rich. I'm rich. It means to be extremely wealthy. Extremely I mean, most of their city, they'll rebuild with their own money. Uh, it, it's an amazing, like Philadelphia had to have help coming in, and, and when, the, when the earthquakes took place, most of it, they'll rebuild with their own money. I am increased with goods. So God just keeps blessing. So I not only get a big barn full, I build another big barn full. And when that one gets full, I build another big barn full. Uh, my wife ain't here in this service, so I can talk about her. We went up yesterday afternoon, and <clears throat> we're trying to find a couple of specific things related to the surgery coming up, and I've got a shower, a shower chair that I've used for a long time. And so we went to our sto storage facility in Springboro, Ohio, to go through stuff that we can't live without. Okay? Now, they've been up there three years. We have visited it three times but we can't live without it. I'm just at, why? Because we just keep storing and storing and storing and storing and storing. You know how many millions of dollars people are making off of people who are storing their junk? You couldn't sell it at a garage sale. I mean, you can't give it away. And yet we just keep building bigger barns and bigger barns and bigger barns. Rich, increased with goods, but number three, boy, 
uh, I am self-sufficient. I'm in need of nothing, they said. Hey, we're rich. God, it's been, man, Joel Osteen would have had a ball right here. Health, wealth, and prosperity. Man, he would have had a ball and said, boy, you can have your best life now. Yes, you can. Jesus said, let me give you the real evaluation of who you are. Here's what you say. I'm rich. I'm increased with goods. Just, I got so much stuff, I don't know what to do with it. Uh, do you get that? I'm 62 now. And uh, when it comes to Christmas, I've begged all of my kids, I, I don't need nothing. That's not good English, but it's accurate. Listen, I'm trying to give away most of the stuff I got. Everybody all right? I mean, I went from a great big house to a smaller house. It's the best decision I ever made in my life. Because now I got a bunch of stuff I don't have to worry about anymore. I don't have to oil it, grease it, graze it, cut it. I don't have to do anything with it. I'm rich, increased with goods. Got so much stuff, don't want to. And, and listen, by the way, just as we told the Roman, keep your tax money. Who was that Sarah Palin years ago told the federal government don't need the money to build that bridge? Hey, keep your money. We're, we're fine. We're, we're, in, we're rich, increased with goods. Don't have it. And listen to what Jesus says. First of all, here's the analogy Jesus gives. All right, I'm, I'm going to read it. And so we'll understand. He says, first of all, you're, re- you're, you're ignorant, number one. All right, where do you get that from, Pastor? Listen to what it says. I don't, I, don't get, I don't get to make stuff up. I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. Listen, and you do not know. They're ignorant. Ignorant. Am I okay? Listen to what the proverb writer would say. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. For you do not know what a day will bring forth. So don't boast. That, that's called pride. That's arrogance. You don't know. That's ignorance. Nobody knows. Nobody knows we're gonna, if we're going to have the rest of this day. He said, you don't know what a day will bring forth. So he goes into these guys' life and says, uh, reality check number one. Listen, as I wrote to... Uh, Corinth and Ephesus and Thessalonica, the church, fastest growing church is the church of the ignorant brethren. Paul wrote to Corinth and said, I would not have you to be ignorant brethren. And it is growing through the ranks of the United States as never before. So he said, well, I don't like that word ignorant. Hey, take it up with Jesus one day. I mean, he phrases a lot better. Yeah, he does. The writer does. You do not know. Okay. Uh, he just says, loser. Okay, and by right, double dog loser. There you are. Right, that's what I do with my grandkids. You, you're wretched. Interesting. Remember, this is a famous medical clinic. All right. So, the word wretched there was direct reference in the Greek language to a boil or a blister they can't get to heal, and it just irritates you. If it's a blister on your foot, it just irritates you wherever you go. If it's a boil, it's just, it's just an irritating thing that you can't get rid of. He says, no, you, you don't realize, um, you know, that not only are you irritating the people around you, you irritate me. Everybody okay? And Jesus just says, listen, we're going to get real here. And then he says, you're miserable. Hey, Laodicea. When you walk by all them beggars laying on the side of the road begging out in front of your church and you look down on them and you pity them, that's the word for miserable. When I look at you, I pity you, Jesus said. I pity you. Uh, It breaks my heart to see the spiritual condition you're in and you don't realize it. Then he says, you're poor, a beggar who would depend on, on something for happiness. Note the difference between three and four. Number three, the pity was what the church felt for the people they would walk by, almost like the parable of the Good Samaritan, and they would walk by them on Sunday, and sometimes they'd help, sometimes they wouldn't. It was beggar's row. I mean, man, it was their only hope, and maybe somebody there would love them and be charitable to them. Now he goes to the heart of the matter. You are poor. You're a beggar and you're depending on something else. Listen to how it's attached for your happiness. Your happiness is based on your stuff. It's based on the things you can accumulate. Listen, 
Many times it's almost like the American dream we teach. Four-bedroom house, two bathrooms, couple of acres, nice little dog, white picket fence around it. You drive a nice car. You wear a nice suit, alligator shoes that are snapping up at your knees. I mean, you, you, you just got it. You've arrived. Man, you're the poster child for GQ or one of them Qs. And all of a sudden, God walks in and gives an analogy. And finally, he says, uh, you're blind. And he goes to their, their um, ISAV center again. But he's not talking about physical blindness. He's talking about spiritual. And finally, he'll say, uh, you're naked. See, Laodicea had gone from spiritual maturity back to spiritual infancy. It wasn't that they weren't a believer. They had just reverted back. You know, having to go through what Donna had to go through with her mom Vivian and others that I have watched through the years that get the, the dreaded uh, thing of dementia or then into sometimes full-blown Alzheimer. One of the things that the last year in both her dad's life and in uh, her mother's life, both my dad and mom went very quickly, and, but uh, they, they, they went from adults back to being almost like a preschooler again. And I remember Earl, we had, to get, we had to go get Earl. He wanted his hammers, his pliers, all those things that he used to work on with bicycles. And so he couldn't have any of those things. So we actually went and bought a little Fisher-Price tool kit and brought in. And he played with it every day till his death. Jesus says, listen, you're acting like preschoolers. You were here, now you're there. You're not out of the family, you're a part of the family, but you're a babe in Christ again, and you got to go back to the beginning and start all over in your growth uh, process in spiritual growth. Now, before I run out of time, and I'll finish this next week, um, I, I really want to spend a little time on the floor. And we're going to talk about the counsel, the admonition, and all of that that's given to him next week. But uh, Jesus will use an analogy here uh, because Laodicea also was a place where construction took place and things of construction would happen. But Jesus gave a very, very striking analogy. Um, here's what I want you to, to get when Jesus is using this one, first of all, in Laodicea. Many times, uh, preachers will run to this text, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door, I will come in and sup with him, dine with him, and he with me. And many, many times, preachers will run to that, and they will give a gospel invitation for someone to receive Jesus as Savior. Please hear my voice. has nothing to do with lost people. Now, you can do wrong analogies, and you can sometimes you know, try to make things fit, but it doesn't fit. This was written to believers who were in rebellion. They needed to be zealous and do what? Here's our friend word again, repent. And Jesus says, listen, just first of all, when it comes to salvation, can I help you on this one? The door's never closed, ever. Just doesn't close. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus said what? I am the door by me if any man enters in. He will be saved. Guess what? He may go in for a while. He may come back out for a while. He's not lost. He's just out there running around the pasture. All right? He will go in and out and find pasture. But the door to salvation is never closed. Matter of fact, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, and immediately I was after these things, I behold, a door was opened in heaven. They don't have closed doors in heaven. The only reason you close a door or a gate is because you're worried about an impending attack or an intruder coming at night, and Jesus is bad. He ain't worried about that. So the door of salvation is always open. Listen, when we walk away from God and we begin to rebel against God, spiritually speaking, our fellowship with Christ, which is just on the other side of the door, we're standing out here now. We're still a believer in Christ. Well, we've closed the door. And so back here, we're saying, I'm increased with goods. I'm rich, have need of nothing. We're standing there, and Jesus walks up to your front door. Are you listening? He walks up to your front door, and here's where the analogy always goes. All right, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And man, if you don't answer, 
he'll start pounding louder. Uh, and he'll keep pounding louder. I want you to understand exactly what the Scripture says. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone, anybody hears my voice. So, so here's what he's doing, Jim. And you have it, but you've walked away from God. I'm using you as an analogy. It's a bad part about setting up front. All right? You've walked away from God. You, you've closed the door of fellowship. And now, please get what Jesus said. Here's what he says. Hey, hey, Jim, Jim, hey, Jim, hey, Jim, I know you're in there, man. I can hear the TV running. You're watching the Bengals lose again. Come on, Jim. All right, come on. He's calling. He's not mad at you. He's calling out your name. And he says, all, all you got to do, anybody can do this. All you got to do is open the door. I'll come in. Hey, we'll have lunch together. We'll watch the Bengals lose together. Now they're not going to lose today. I'm a prophet. <laughs> well, probably a false prophet, but I'm a prophet. <laughs> All right? So understand, the invitation for the fellowship of Jesus Christ is one that only you can cut off. Jesus never cuts it off. So, uh, so we got to ask this question. Next week, I'm going to use a different prop, and it'll hit home a little bit better. But i got to ask the question, spiritually speaking, is Jesus outside standing on the front porch of the, uh, on the stoop out there or the front of the church and saying, hey, guys, I would love to come back to Urban Crest if you'd just open the door. Remember, he wrote this to the angel, to the pastor teacher of the church. He addressed seven letters to seven different churches, but when he gets to Laodicea, hear Jesus' desperation. He doesn't say, hey, pastor, come open the door. He said, if anybody would go back and open the door. You don't have to be a deacon. You don't have to be a saint. If anybody will open the door, I, I, I really would like to fellowship with you again. And by the way, to him who overcomes, I, I'll, I'll clothe him in white rain. Oh, everybody, everybody okay? Uh, can, can I do one more analogy? And we're done. You know what it means? Hey, Mark, come here. I'm always picking on you, but might as well do it today and have fun. Jesus says, uh, listen, you need to buy gold tried in the fire. You think suffering is a problem. You need more of it because suffering will drive you to me. And he says, and, and I'll give you a white raiment. Mark, here's what he said. You know, this is what Jesus is saying. Here's the picture this morning. Here's what Jesus said. And, and by the way, nobody in that seven cities would ever approach their quote, unquote, gods with soiled garments. It was a disgrace to do so. So here's what Jesus says. Hey, Mark, listen. Here's what I want to do, bud. I want to wrap the right clothing around him again. Let's go home and have dinner. Let's go play golf. Hey, now we went, we've hit home, amen? He said, hey, listen, can you imagine? Thanks, Mark. Jesus is waiting, and he says, when you come home, by the way, we're going to take off that dirty garment. It's a soiled garment. The inside's still pure. The inside's still saved, but we're going to take a garment, and we're going to wrap it around you again, and you're going to walk home white and clean, before Almighty God. Listen, where, where are you at in the process? Have you walked through the open door? And maybe you, you see right now and you go, there, there's no hope. Well, let's say it again. As long as there's breath in your body, as a believer in Christ, Jesus, man, I got to get that door to shut, don't I? Been working out too much at the spa. Jesus, there he is. But listen, He's just not knocking. He's, he's, he's saying, hey, Clay, I'd like to go home with you. Clark, I want, I'd like to have lunch with you today. Would you open the door? So where are you at in the process? Jesus is mad at you. He loves you. And he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and I discipline. Yep, I do. I got to bring you home somehow. I love you so much, I won't let you keep going the direction you're going in. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for changing my life, a sinner who deserves hell. And yet, Jesus, you forgave me. And Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you loved me so much that in 1986, you came looking at me and you knocked on the door of my heart and said, Tom, don't forget why we do what we do. It's about those kids. It's about changing lives. Lord Jesus, I, I pray first, as I always pray, if there's anyone here they don't know you, they'll find you today. They'll say, Jesus, preacher's right. 
I need to walk through that door of salvation. Jesus, today I give you my life. But Lord, for we who know you, Lord Jesus, bring us home today. It's a time of thanksgiving. Oh, I pray as Dave sang and led us in worship, we understand how you're a good, good father. Oh, man, Lord Jesus, and help us to give thanks with a grateful heart, a heart that is right with you. And so, Lord, I, I pray these simply in Jesus' name.